weird things have been happening in my neighborhood. Weird, awful things. My cat got literally cut in half and laid on my lawn. When he was watching my chickens while we were on vacation, we came home and there was a chicken on our front door with the claw of a hammer in its um, body, dead. Why did I call the cops? I don't know why I didn't call the cops. What seemed to be a normal summer evening in Inverness, Florida, quickly took a dark turn when a 911 dispatcher received a frantic call from a 17-year-old boy named Carlos Hollowell. What he discovered was horrific. His mother, Denise Hollowell, was lying on her side and gasping for air. There was an axe buried three-fourths of the way into her skull. Carlos immediately rushed outside and called for help in disbelief at the scene he had just witnessed. He and his mother had just been to a family friend's funeral earlier that day. According to Carlos, once they had arrived home, they both were enjoying peaceful naps at their lake house, blissfully unaware of the nightmare that would soon become reality. Medical personnel performed CPR on Denise while she laid on her side. They weren't able to turn her onto her back because of the angle of the axe. Unfortunately, they were unable to revive her. She was pronounced dead that evening on July 13, 2019. But who would want to kill Denise? She lived a very private life on the surface. She enjoyed her quiet home on the lake with her son Carlos, who she adopted from Guatemala after being adopted herself as a child. There was nobody they could think of that would have bad blood with Denise until Carlos gave them an interesting piece of information. He had a younger brother who hadn't been home in four years. Denise had adopted a second child named Angel from Honduras. According to Denise's best friend, Amy Alford, she had adopted Angel not because she wanted another son, but because she wanted Carlos to have a sibling. Amy says that Denise was disappointed when Angel began to show signs that he was troubled because Carlos wasn't getting the experience she had hoped that he would. According to Denise, Angel was repeatedly acting out and running away. On one occasion in 2016, when Angel was 12 years old, Denise had called 911 after another runaway attempt. After this incident, things took a grim twist. Responding deputies were shocked when they saw Angel's door was bolted and his windows were covered with nails and boards. The room itself was barren, with nothing more than an air mattress on a metal frame, books, and a bucket to urinate and defecate into. It only got worse as Angel spoke with caseworkers from the Department of Child Services. Angel told a caseworker that allegedly Denise was physically and verbally abusive. He claimed that she slapped him when she was angry and she made him get naked and clean the bathroom. Angel also alleged that she and Carlos hit him in his privates with their fists. Because Angel had both bruising on his hips and arm and scratches on his face, Denise was placed under arrest. Carlos, on the other hand, claimed that Angel was making all of these things up. In fact, Carlos alleged that Angel had been abusive to their mother. According to him, Angel had run away three years earlier by crawling out of his window. Denise had boarded up his windows as a preventative measure, same as the bolted door. He stood by his mother 100%, stating directly, all allegations against my mother are false. At only 13 years old, he attempted to bail his mother out of jail. It seemed that he and his mother had a strong bond, and he had a lot of love and respect for her. Denise was in jail for two weeks before she was released, but her life didn't go back to normal when she came home. She was forced to resign from her teaching job due to allegations of child abuse, and both of her sons were placed in foster care. However, Denise's attorney had a defense that was so strong, he would convince the judge to drop all charges against her. Denise was an avid journal writer and her documentation of Angel's alleged behavioral issues would be of great benefit to her. She said he was having issues at school too, involving fits of rage. Denise claimed that she slept by his door to prevent him from running away and that the bucket was only in his room in case he didn't make it to the bathroom. The judge was convinced and let Denise out on house arrest. Even one of Denise's best friends, Adele Hunnell, recalls Carlos and Denise being worried that Angel might try to hurt them in their sleep. After Denise's arrest, Angel was placed in a foster home, but he ran away. Due to the fact that Angel was a minor, his records were sealed for his protection, so some people theorize that we will really never know the truth about his actual behavior. Within five months, Denise had Carlos back in her custody. She had hoped that Angel would come home, but professionals said that living with Denise was not in Angel's best interest so she signed away her rights. Amy noted that Denise never brought Angel up again and wouldn't talk about him. Instead, she focused on her new job working with children with autism, her dogs, and going on trips. 
Carlos spent his time with his girlfriend, Kayla. Life seemed to go on perfectly fine without Angel. Carlos and Denise's close friends all attested to how violent and troubled they believed Angel was, so after Denise was killed, suspicions rose. As detectives spoke with Denise's neighbors, it became apparent that there had been strange activity going on. Weird things have been happening in my neighborhood since, since Carlos, Denise and Carlos moved in, which was about the same time they were adopting Angel, but Angel hadn't gotten there yet. But in hindsight, I'm just like, geez, what if that was Carlos? What if that started then with my cat got literally cut in half and laid on my lawn and there was no blood, but it was sliced in half. Cars were frequently pulling in and out of the neighborhood, and animals were going missing. As more information started to come out from different sources that the detectives spoke with, they began to piece together a fuller picture of Denise's struggles with parenting. While Angel had been given the title of the troubled child, Carlos had his demons too. He had been partying a lot, spending too much time with girls, and not performing to Denise's standards in school. He was ultimately dethroned from his golden child status just months before her murder, when Denise found out he'd been kicked out of a Christian school in January of 2019. He successfully concealed this from her until the following May. Carlos and his mother had colorful fights about him sneaking girls into the house, partying, and selling drugs, hence the strange traffic in the neighborhood. He escalated, wrecking a pickup truck and eventually attempting to take his own life. Denise was unsure what to do with him. In May of 2019, Carlos went to stay with a couple that he was friends with, Stephanie and Damian Irving. His girlfriend Kayla says that he seemed to be happier there, as they were more lenient than Denise. So when he lived with us the first time, he had just overdosed on um, tried to commit suicide again. So he was in the hospital, and when he was discharged, he was discharged on medicine for bipolar disorder. And I'm telling you that medicine worked, okay? It took him from like so anxious it made you uncomfortable. You could feel his anxiety mm -hmm. to he became more calm, more rational, more easy to talk to. Like he didn't get so angry. Please note that the psychological analysis in this video is not based upon a formal assessment. It appears that Carlos was showing all the early signs of antisocial behavior. Partying, promiscuity, getting kicked out of school, selling drugs, and substance use are typical early warning signs of antisocial personality disorder. Carlos's antisocial behaviors could be genetic in that he may have inherited these tendencies from his biological parents. However, while APD does have a genetic component, the behaviors that children observe from their primary caretakers are very influential when it comes to the development of a child's personality. As you will see, Denise also has strong antisocial traits, maybe even APD. Found um, Carlos's medicine, which apparently he stopped taking, and upon opening his Prozac here, there is a gross white blob substance in the bottle of liquid. He's not taking his Prozac or he's turned it into something else to take. During Carlos's stay with the Irvings, Denise came over multiple times to have sit-down conversations that led to arguments, some of which were recorded by Stephanie, the woman Carlos was staying with when he left Denise's house. When you know he doesn't have a job, why are you asking He has a job. He told me he has a job with you guys. Okay, he said he's before going that, he did it. And you were harassing How much was she originally saying you owed like 600 bucks all the time working? Well, we have to come up with, uh, now I gotta come up with breaks. No. Why is it my fault? Shut up! Why is he paying for breaks? Shut breaks? up and I'll Pay answer. All this shut money. up! You break your What did I tell you today? I don't know. You said pay the phone bill. And then you're going to charge. Why does he have to pay a phone bill? Shh. Because it's He's a child. There, there you go. She sees you as a child. All you scream and want to be seen as an adult. No, no I said I want to be said treated. A child. I said I want to be treated Teenager. as my age. You're Sorry. the one that keeps calling him an adult. Hi. I've recorded you. They've so, heard you so talk. So we've got you now. Right. You barged into their house. They've so? seen you talk. And now Stephanie's seeing how you talk to me. No, I, I don't care. Stephanie had recorded the altercation to prove how aggressive Denise's behavior was. It was apparent to everyone around him why living with his mother hadn't worked out. Like, Denise was bashing Carlos. Um, do you know that Carlos 
wrecked a fifteen thousand dollar truck and do you know that car she was just i said he didn't wreck a fifteen thousand dollar truck he tried to kill himself there's a big difference denise and i said this because he was crying and he's like he was like mom you kicked me out you kicked me out why would you kick me out when i needed you most i just tried to kill myself and you told me i had to leave so i was witnessing this it was very peculiar and weird to me that her son is sobbing saying i needed you you know, I just wanted to die. And she like wouldn't even hug him, wouldn't acknowledge the tears. It was really bizarre. The description here of Denise's behavior shows her emotional issues. Parents who were physically and or emotionally abusive toward their own children oftentimes have APD themselves or at least have antisocial traits. Denise seemed to have issues with poor anger control and may have been emotionally abusive towards Carlos. Her aggression is a key APD trait because individuals with this disorder have severe, uncontrolled anger issues. He may have modeled some of Denise's antisocial behaviors. This is important to note because it could mean that he isn't just a troubled teen that Denise couldn't handle, but instead the dynamic between Carlos and Denise that ultimately led to a completely dysfunctional and unhealthy relationship. When a family has several members who have a personality disorder, these sorts of toxic dynamics occur and there is a constant conflict. Since people with personality disorders tend to have poor insight, poor judgment, and poor ability to self-regulate, they often don't have the awareness to see that the relationship is unhealthy. In this case, Denise being the adult in the relationship should have recognized that her relationship with her son was unhealthy for both of them. Eventually, Denise did want Carlos to come back home, but he was hesitant as they often had fights about money and how much or little he had contributed to the household. His resentment had built up as he felt responsible for keeping finances afloat. Stephanie Irving, the woman who Carlos stayed with, commented on Denise's expectations about money and Carlos's contributions to the household. She was always asking him for money and saying that he owed her hundreds of dollars. And I would say, what does he owe you money for? Oh, the phone. Oh, this. Oh, she, she just had like this running list. And some of the things were like, um, we have to repair a fence in our property. And I'm like, okay, is he your husband or your son? Because I was getting confused. Like the kid doesn't have a job. How is he supposed to help pay for a fence on the property? When I witnessed her behavior at the house. It was crazy because I was renovating my house and I have Carlos helped me working on the house. I paid him like a week before and he didn't give the mom the money. So the mom came over and said, hey, you know it's illegal to we'll work a 17 year old and not pay him. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? I said, I paid the kid last week. Mm -hmm. So I end up have to pay her the $120. That's when I start not trusting the kid. Because I said, if, even if you get the money and you didn't want to pay your mom, you should have given, keep me in the loop. So I yeah. know what's going on. Carlos contemplated for a while whether or not he should move back in with his mother. He created a list of pros and cons to help weigh out his options. On the cons side, he wrote, Mom might no longer talk to me, no longer her son. She would be crushed, maybe no help at college. I would feel like I'm betraying her. But for pros, he wrote, Stability, freedom, help, and guidance. Because we're not the only family that he's lived with. You know, like she's done this before and so many times where she, he's had to find a place to live. Like any time parenting got a little difficult for her, she would just be like, I'm done. You got to find a place to go. And that started when he was 16. When he left, she's like, if it wasn't for me, you would be standing at the border with all those other idiots trying to get into the country. And I guess that like to him was like the worst thing she ever put it on. It like stabbed him Big, sla big slap in the face. After stewing on it, Carlos finally told Denise the only way that he would move back in with her is if she agreed to his list of demands and had it notarized by a bank. He was requesting that she pay for a vehicle, housing, and other living expenses. On June 12th, just over a month before Denise's murder, Carlos left the Irvings home and moved back in with his mother, but they continued to have loud fights that could be heard by neighbors. At one point, Denise began to fear that Carlos would do something to harm her. She even asked Amy to make sure that her dogs were taken care of in the event that something happened to her. Her friends were very concerned about Carlos's escalating behavior and the possibility that the situation could turn more sinister. I said to her, I said, please tell me the truth. I said, did he do that to you? No, no, I, I fell. <laughs> I said, please.
please tell me the truth. She would never admit it to me. Oh. But apparently she admitted it to Peggy, that he pushed her, and she did fall, but he pushed her. And then she ended up with a broken wrist and the other arm as well, and a concussion. I'm not saying you're saying he did it. I'm saying, do you think he could have done something like this? I sure don't want to say he did, but at the same time, I knew when, when Denise broke her arm earlier, that was weird. But if he could have done that to her, if he could have pushed her so hard that she got a concussion and broke her arm, then, yeah. I mean, like in the heat of the moment, maybe? I don't know. After the murder, Amy recalled Denise's request and concluded that Denise would want her to take care of Carlos after her death, too. DCS had first taken Carlos to his girlfriend Kayla's house and asked her parents if they would mind letting Carlos stay with them for a little while, as he was still 17 years old but they didn't feel comfortable with their teenage daughter's boyfriend living under the same roof. In light of the events, Kayla's parents stopped allowing the two to see each other because they were beginning to feel uneasy about Carlos. It was then that he moved in with Amy. While he was with her, she felt that same discomfort. She had the idea in her head that Carlos was a killer, a big enough fear to keep Waspray by her bed in case he tried to harm her while she was sleeping. She felt guilty for this, acknowledging that her assumptions may have been incorrect and he may just be a troubled teen dealing with his mother's tragic death. One reason that Amy and others suspected Carlos was that he wasn't grieving like others expected him to. This was greatly disturbing to the people in his life due to the severity of the trauma. I've talked to Ron, my husband, and said he did not seem sad. He was upset, but I didn't hear the sadness, and I was surprised at that. And uh, I kept saying, you know, that his, that his mom has a few acres and a couple other states. I don't know if that's true or not. But he said when he turns 18, he's probably going to move to one of them in North Carolina. So he's like, yeah, man, you know, it, it sucks what happened, but, you know, like, I can't wait to, to get that as far as, like, the land and the cars and all that stuff. And he also had, like, no remorse. He had no problem telling me whatever. However, his journals told a different story than the people around Carlos. In his entries, he wrote about how much he missed his mom and pleaded for her to come back. He described what he saw before he called 911 on the night of Denise's death and how he would never be able to unsee the image. He scrawled mother and son among a page full of doodles and had photos of Denise tucked in a compartment inside the journal. The theory that Angel was the one to swing the axe was an easy one. Given the circumstances of his departure from the family, he was the only person anyone could think of that may be out for revenge. It wouldn't surprise anyone for him to be filled with anger and resentment toward Denise. Detectives then made a shocking discovery. Angel, 15 years old, was believed to be incarcerated for an alleged armed robbery. Although the robbery allegation has not been confirmed by any official source or records, it's believed he was incarcerated at the time of Denise's murder. He was immediately cleared. However, Carlos began to confide in friends about what he saw the night of his mother's death, and his retellings of the story were suspicious. Some friends decided that distancing themselves from him was their best bet. Carlos began to pick up on this and even confronted friends about whether or not they believed that he was innocent. He said there's no real evidence except for a glove that's outside. Later on, he tells me that there was footprints in the room. It wasn't his. Did he said what kind of glove it was? He said it was a rubber glove, and he said that it was filled with alcohol. And then he went into very like vivid detail of like, well, somebody uh, grabbed a rubber glove, filled it with rubbing alcohol, shook it up, and threw it outside. And he's like, well, I know it wasn't me, because that's not even my glove size. After that, you know, like, uh, he kept throwing red flags, like everything he would tell me after that. I was like, so what are you going to do in the meantime? And he's like, Oh, well, you know, I'm really glad with my new foster parents. And uh, he said that they were like the perfect match. They let him basically do whatever he wants. Huh. Which at that time, I didn't think anything of it. But uh, when I started like, putting things together, it's, you know, that's sketchy. The rumor is, yeah, he killed his mom with an axe. That axe, I, that was my Halloween costume. One friend grew so suspicious of Carlos's involvement in his mother's death that she actually began to secretly record her conversations with him, such as this chilling clip. That's crazy. Do you know if they have any evidence against you? Mm -hmm. 
I know they're going to interview everybody or interrogate but if you just be ready, make sure you just, you're good. Have you been able to talk to Kayla? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I've had to come to terms with the fact that I won't be able to see her much, if at all anymore. Because um, I just want to protect her and her family as my top priority. It's going to hurt, but as long as she's safe and whatnot, then that's how it's got to be. Reviewing the case, the police noted something curious about the first interrogation with Carlos. He seemed to be emotionally flat for someone who had just found their mother with an axe in their head. Not only that, he was even condescending and rude to detectives. What I'm trying to say is if I'm going to open a door and the dogs are there, they'll go crazy and barking until the door's open. I'm not going to open the door and run off. Your house is in the middle of nowhere for me to explain if I'm going to open a door. I can't, I can't run that fast with the dogs. Anymore. I don't know. You guys are detectives. Aren't you supposed to figure this out? The no. doors are open on the side. The gate doors are open, so the dogs are everywhere. And the front door is still open. So I have no idea how it got there. I want to know how it got there, and I don't want to know why. I do not know, and I want to know. Because for some reason, my dogs have been let out where they won't bark and won't do anything because they run off. As soon as they're out of that gate, they will run off because that is the only time they get outside of that gate. So I don't know what you guys are trying to get out of me right now, but I didn't do anything and would never do anything to my mother like that. As much as we, uh, we used to bicker and, and get back at each other fighting sometimes and then peace and then back, back and forth and then peace again, never. Never in a million years would I ever think to do that. She's my mom. I was adopted at age four and I've been with her forever. Carlos being emotionally flat, condescending and rude toward detectives are common features of a person with APD. His lack of emotion despite his mother being killed could be an indication of his lack of remorse and lack of empathy. People with APD can be very detached from their emotions. This is how they're able to commit horrific acts. They have to be able to shut off emotion to lie, steal, cheat, or kill. Most typical people would be respectful and cooperative of law enforcement, especially in the midst of an interrogation. However, people with APD are very grandiose, conceited, and entitled. They feel superior to others, so they won't heed to anyone, including and especially to authority figures. Since people with APD put themselves first and are out to satisfy their own needs and wants, they don't take kindly to anyone trying to tell them what to do. This is another likely explanation for Carlos's attitude during the interrogation. On top of the suspicion building against Carlos, he also stated that there were no working security cameras, only a broken one outside of the house. However, a manual to a different kind of security camera was found at the scene. Right in plain view were the cables that showed three working security cameras had been removed. The surface was covered in dust everywhere except for the areas where the security cameras had been sitting. If detectives could get a hold of these security cameras, there was a chance they could obtain a photo of their suspect. Carlos was now a suspect. DCS removed him from Amy's custody. They were sure they were just steps away from solving the case. Denise's phone had last been pinged by the lake outside of the Hollowell home. The dive team was able to quickly recover all three security cameras and, a bonus surprise, Denise's cell phone. All four devices were found in shallow water, not far from where they'd been thrown into the lake. The digital forensics team got to work, attempting to harvest any useful information from the water-damaged electronics. Although nothing useful was found on any of the security cameras, Denise's phone activity helped to create a timeline for the murder. Records were able to show that her phone had been connected to a charger at 3.12 p.m. and unplugged at 3.45 p.m. Her phone activity went berserk at 6.18 p.m., the moment it was submerged underwater. While Denise's phone records didn't hold information that solved the case, detectives discovered a shocking revelation when digital forensics analyzed Carlos's phone activity. It showed that Carlos was actively using his phone the entire time he was home, including during the murder. This disproved his version of the story in which he said he was asleep when the crime took place. Additionally, it showed every step he took during the murder. His phone pinged him right beside the lake at the moment Denise's phone and security cameras were submerged underwater. He was on the phone with 911 right as he was disposing of the evidence. With this new information, investigators had Carlos backed into a corner. He acted surprised about the security cameras, maintaining that he had never seen them before. He pretended to be excited about what Denise's phone might uncover. It was then that the interrogator confronted him with his own phone records. 
As Carlos began to accept that he was no longer able to maintain his innocence, he admitted that he went outside to chop wood after another fight with Denise on the day of her murder. He said that chopping wood with the axe was what he would typically do to release pent-up rage. However, this time was different. Carlos claimed he remembered sharpening the axe, walking inside, seeing the axe in the back of her head, and throwing the devices into the lake, but nothing else. This was taken as a full-on confession. He would later reveal that he went inside to grab a glass of water, but instead walked into his mother's room, looked away, and then swung the axe into her head. He looked at her to find her gasping for air and told her that he would get her help. It was then that he threw the security cameras into the lake and called 911. Going outside to chop wood to let out anger is actually a pretty okay coping skill. However, with Carlos, it seemed that it didn't really work to alleviate his severe anger. This could be because people with APD are often inconsolable when they're angry. They can't calm themselves down and mentally regroup the way a typical person can. People with APD are also highly impulsive, so when Carlos went to get a glass of water, but instead walked into his mother's room and killed her, he may have acted on impulse. He might have seen the opportunity when Denise was asleep in her bed and he took advantage of her vulnerability in that moment. Another piece of evidence that shows Carlos's impulsivity in the moment is the fact that he described having some remorse afterwards. People with APD, although callous, can still have instances of some level of empathy and remorse. However, it's just at a much lesser degree, and it's also selective. Maybe Carlos had some remorse because Denise is his mother. Carlos told detectives that the fights between him and his mother were more frequent after Denise's arrest, stating that he didn't feel connected to her anymore after that incident. He claimed that like many fights before, Denise had resorted to really personal digs. Carlos alleged that Denise would say things like, if I didn't adopt you, you'd be on the street, and you're a disappointment to me. Both he and the Irvings claimed that she regularly made racist remarks to get under his skin. According to Carlos, these are the insults that pushed him over the edge. The way that the state presented the case portrayed Carlos as an entitled kid who was driven to kill because his mother set ground rules and expected him to abide by them. They argued that the time he spent sharpening the axe and dwelling on his anger toward Denise proves premeditation. The defense, however, told a different story. They claimed he was a troubled kid with abandonment issues, being abandoned by his biological parents, adopted by another woman and taken to another country, and then being threatened with abandonment at every sign of being bad drove Carlos, who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, to anger. Despite Carlos's previous statements to DCS that his younger brother Angel was lying about being abused, he now claims that his home life was toxic and abusive, and Denise was very controlling and aggressive. The very first day I met him, told me about him trying to kill himself with the red pickup truck, smashing it into the tree. At the time, he was seeing like, you'll never know what it's like to not be wanted by your parents. He admitted to me that, you know, he had problems with his mom and he really didn't feel part of that family. He felt like an outsider. He started thinking that like the relationship between him and his mom wasn't that bad. I think Carlos was just so used to the abuse. I mean, I don't understand why an abuser stays in an abusive situation. I don't know why, like, he didn't go to the police. And then we had the conversation in front of his mom, and he told his mom in front of me that Stephanie knows everything. And uh, she didn't deny it in front of me. Carlos Hollowell appeared in court on September 14th, 2021. He was found guilty of premeditated first-degree murder and will serve life with no parole. His sentence is eligible to be reviewed in 2044 because he was a minor at the time that the crime was committed. Shockingly, Carlos accepts his life sentence and doesn't wish for anything less. In a jailhouse interview, he said, You take a life, you owe a life. Red flags and tips for those who are in this situation. Carlos's deviant behaviors, promiscuity, defiance, getting kicked out of school, selling and consuming drugs, are all signs of the development of antisocial personality disorder, APD. Typically, individuals who commit murder tend to have some history of physical violence towards others. Carlos had reportedly broken Denise's wrist, arm, and gave her a concussion. These are warning signs of being capable of severe physical violence. In this case, Denise was abusive too, but it seemed like Carlos was more severely abusive, at least physically. 
Despite Denise being afraid for her life and verbalizing her fear to her friend Amy, she continued to repeat the same patterns of wanting to try to resolve the issues between her and Carlos, or live with Carlos again even though their communication always ended in conflict. At the very least, she could have sought help for her son's sake, as she must have known that he was going down a very dangerous path. Another basic red flag here, but still important to mention, is the fact that oftentimes victims receive all types of warnings that the perpetrator may go further than just being physically abusive and may instead take lethal action. Anytime a perpetrator threatens to kill the other person, makes references to having a weapon, it should be taken seriously. The victim is often so frozen in fear and guilt and their emotional dependency to the perpetrator is so deep that they make all sorts of excuses and justifications for the perpetrator's words and actions. Even though all the signs are in the victim's face, they ignore it, either because they're fearful of taking definitive action, or they have such low self-esteem that they no longer trust their own intuition. Abuse will do this. They lose their identity, they no longer trust themselves, and they struggle to make any decisions, decisions that could potentially save their lives.